of the 104th Infantry Division. What was your rank? Uh, I was a corporal during the war period. I was discharged as a sergeant. And where, and where did you serve? In, uh, in Europe. Where were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Um, where were you living at the time? I had just finished my sophomore year at the uh, University of Illinois uh, when I entered the service. Why did you join? I enlisted uh, because it gave me a better opportunity to have some choice of what branch I would be serving in uh, as opposed to being waiting, waiting for the draft. I would uh, probably have gone in at about the same time, but uh, I chose to enlist. Do you recall your first days in service? Very well. I uh, reported to uh, Camp Grant, Illinois, and uh, two days after I arrived, I was in the hospital with measles. And it turns out that most of the people who came at the same time that I did uh, shipped out right away and went to the West Coast and they wound up being assigned to the Pacific uh, Theater of War. In my case, uh, because I was in the hospital for several days, I stayed, uh, uh, I was not able to go with that, that, that first shipment, and my group went to the East Coast, and I wound up in the uh, uh, European Theater. So a case of measles right in my first week of service uh, probably had a lot to do with where I ultimately was assigned. Tell me about your boot camp or your training experiences. I took uh, field artillery uh, basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And one of the things that uh, is accomplished in uh, basic training is learning, teaching you how to be inconvenienced, uh, how to uh, uh, be exposed to weather, uh, how to uh, follow orders, uh, how to uh, get up in the middle of the night and stand guard duty and do things of that sort. In basic training, you aren't taught that many things. It's not as though you're in a classroom that much of the time. By and large, it's a matter of adjusting you to that way of life. And they, they give you the, the experiences that uh, uh, you'll uh, ultimately have when you get in combat. And uh, uh, that's the primary purpose of uh, uh, what's accomplished in basic training. As soon as I finished uh, my training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, the Army sent uh, uh, a number of us off to colleges uh, just as a holding place uh, until we were needed for uh, combat. And in my case, I went to Rutgers University and I was there for a full semester. Uh, and uh, I was actually given credit uh, for the semester then, but I was a full-time uh, uh, Army personnel while I was there, as were all the other people with me in those classes. How did you stay in touch with your family? With uh, uh, correspondence. Uh, telephone calls weren't that easy to make at that period of time. There weren't that many available, and uh, it was uh, direct dialing wasn't available. Uh, it was costly, so it really wasn't practical to, to do very much telephoning. So. Uh, the U.S. mail was the, the primary method of communicating. Did you feel any pressure or stress? Well, uh, when you're at that age, uh, that young, uh, you're a, a little bit carefree. And uh, obviously there were some difficulties, but it was much easier on people who were my age, uh, as opposed to those who were, say, five to ten years older, who had uh, a wife or, or wife and children, and uh, that was a far more difficult adjustment for uh, people of that sort. How did people entertain themselves? Well, in this country, uh, at the military bases, uh, we had uh, movie theaters, uh, we had the post exchange where you could get milkshakes and uh, hamburgers, uh, we had athletic fields, we could play softball and touch football, uh, things of that sort. Uh, when I was uh, stationed at Rutgers University, we were only 30 minutes uh, from uh, New York City, and uh, most weekends, uh, uh, or at least 
uh, many weekends, uh, we'd take the train, spend the day in New York City. In fact, I had a chance to uh, view many of the Broadway shows. Uh, servicemen could uh, buy a standing room ticket for like a dollar and a half. And uh, that was a, uh, an easy and uh, great way of being entertained. Uh, at other times uh, in this country, uh, they have large gatherings and high, high uh, visibility people like Bob Hope or Bing Crosby or people of that sort. But uh, I only had that kind of experience in this country, never overseas. You said you served in World War II. Where exactly did you go? Well, we started at the border of uh, Germany, the Belgian-German border, and went uh, 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 eastward across Germany. And uh, we stopped uh, uh, when we met the Russians, uh, 50 miles from Berlin. Okay, do you remember arriving and what was it like? Yes, uh, we departed from the Brooklyn Navy Yard in August of 1944. And uh, it was a very large convoy that went directly to France. In fact, it was the, uh, it was the first convoy of any sort that had gone to, Fr to France uh, uh, following an invasion. We landed in Cherbourg Harbor 90 days uh, after the invasion. Uh, the harbor uh, had not been cleared up sufficiently uh, to allow ships to land there earlier, but uh, that was uh, uh, our uh, entry into uh, uh, Europe. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, when we departed from the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, the entire convoy went out through Long Island Sound. And the reason for that was that gave less exposure to uh, German submarines at uh, the time that you were uh, in, the, uh, in Long Island Sound. What was your job or assignment? Uh, my job uh, with the Field Artillery Unit uh, was an ammunition handler. And uh, what an ammunition handler does is when you pull into a new location, uh, the truck pulls up to the howitzers and uh, you unload the ammunition. And uh, when the ammunition supply truck arrives, you uh, unload that. And then when you get ready to move to the next location, you put it back on the, the uh, truck and away you go. So. Uh, loading howitzer shells off and on the truck is what I spent most of my army days doing. Did you see the combat? Well, we were uh, uh, we were in a combat zone virtually the whole time that we were there from uh, uh, until the end of the war. Were there many casualties in your unit? In our my unit was Battery B of the 385th Field Artillery, and <coughs> we had uh, four. Uh, 105 millimeter howitzers and about 100 men. Uh, with that uh, group of 100, I'd say we had roughly six casualties. And most of our casualties were the, what we call forward observers. These are the people that go uh, up with the infantry and they look and observe where your shells are landing. It's a very, very dangerous kind of assignment. and. Uh, uh, forward observers uh, sometimes killed by friendly fire as well as by enemy fire. But out of our hundred people, I would say that roughly six <coughs> were casualties. Tell me your most memorable experiences. <laughs> Can you stop a minute? Now you've already asked the question, right? Okay. Yep. Tell me of your most memorable experiences. Okay, I'm going to tell you about uh, six uh, events or episodes that uh, our organization was involved in. Uh, the first is the Remagen Bridgehead. Uh, uh, following the successful D-Day invasion, invasion uh, in France, one of the biggest challenges facing the Allied forces was crossing the Rhine River. The Rhine River is a major stream that uh, runs the entire length of the country, and it was really the Germans' last line of defense uh, to protect Berlin as well as to uh, stop the advance of Allied uh, armies. Uh, it was expected that crossing the Rhine would, would uh, call for extensive resources and perhaps uh, even extensive uh, casualties. It turned out to be a less challenging task. On March 7th, 
uh, a railroad bridge crossing the Rhine was captured by the Allied forces. And this was known as the Remagen Bridge, uh, located in the town of Hanif. Uh, the Germans had placed extensive explosives on the bridge uh, with the intention of blowing it up. Uh, but some very brave Americans uh, made their way under the bridge, cut the wires, while other Americans uh, advanced to the east bank of the Rhine and established a, brine, uh, a bridgehead. Now, the Allied commanders realized that uh, uh, the bridge had been damaged to the point that it would collapse. And so they set about constructing a pontoon bridge across the Rhine River, uh, which was one of the greatest engineering feats of the entire war. Uh, this amounted to a series of inflatable devices that were hooked together uh, and crossing a major river, uh, and it had to be strong enough to hold uh, tanks, trucks, and other military equipment. Uh, in about two weeks, the original uh, Remagen Bridge did collapse. And uh, at about that same time, our unit crossed the Rhine on the pontoon bridge. Uh, smoke generators on each side of the river laid down a thick blanket of smoke to screen the bridge from hostile aircraft. Uh, the smoke was so thick that our visibility was about 15 to 20 feet. Uh, traffic on the pontoon bridge was one way for several days and we had no new supplies. For a short period of time we were without ammunition. But we were successful in expanding the bridgehead and certainly this was the beginning of the end uh, for the German forces. Uh, the next event that I'm going to tell you about is uh, uh, interaction with uh, German civilians. A uh, question is often asked if uh, German uh, civilians were subject to any mistreatment by American forces. Uh, we were under strict orders not to fraternize with the Germans, and uh, in truth we had very little contact with them. For the most part they weren't around. Uh, in late 1944 and early 1945 uh, we advanced by pulverizing everything in front of us. Between air raids, tanks, and artillery, uh, there was only rubble in front of us. And it's understandable that the civilians were no longer there. Uh, we did have one experience where we rescued German citizens uh, from their own troops. Uh, on April 11th, uh, 1945, uh, we took up a position in the Hartz Mountains of Germany. Now this was one day before the death of President Roosevelt. The actual battlefront was considerably ahead of us, uh, but some German soldiers had uh, uh, taken refuge uh, in the mountain. And uh, the decision was to just wait them out, wait for them to come out, not go in after them. So for that reason that we were positioned at the base of the mountain. Uh, we set up our unit uh, in a plateau uh, at the base of the mountain. Uh, which consisted of several houses, all undamaged, uh, that was surrounded by a cow pasture. Uh, our units occupied houses on uh, one side of the, the uh, pasture and on the other side were German civilians. Uh, during the day we could look over and uh, see them uh, outside doing their chores, uh, but there was no contact uh, uh, with any of them. Uh, now, late uh, one evening, uh, our guard on duty uh, heard piercing screams uh, coming from this house. And uh, our sergeant took three or four of us uh, over to uh, investigate. Uh, when we entered the house, there were about three women and several, several children. Uh, the women were in a state of panic. And even though they were dealing, we were dealing with a language barrier, uh, they managed to convey to us that uh, uh, their screams had uh, frightened away several German soldiers who had entered their house. Um, now, the Germans left out the back, went out the back door as we came in the front. Uh, we made no attempt to pursue them. But the uh, women indicated that uh, they had been uh, fearful of physical attack, and that was the reason for their uh, blood curdling screams, actually. And uh, they also indicated that they would like to move uh, to an adjacent house. 
Uh, and I personally picked up an infant and carried it to the next house. And when I got there, I turned it over to the mother. And her arms were filled with clothing and uh, other possessions, and she seemed to have no reluctance to uh, have me uh, hold her child. Now, our unit departed about two days later, and we had no further contact uh, with any of the civilians at that location. Now, my next topic uh, is one that uh, can be identified as battle fatigue. Can you stop for me? Uh, the next uh, 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 incident uh, is an example of battle fatigue. Uh, our gun crews on the howitzers reported to a first lieutenant who was the second in command of our unit. Now, I did not report to him, but I was in close association with those who did. Uh, he was known as the executive officer. <clears throat> now, to say that he was disliked uh, would be an understatement. Uh, he was hated, uh, and with good reason. He had an uncontrollable temper, and it was not unusual for him to grab a subordinate by the clothing and uh, just shake him uh, uh, physically. Uh, this uh, lieutenant was weighed about 200 pounds, and uh, he was built like a fire club. Uh, his jeep driver was a corporal who weighed about 150 pounds. And uh, uh, this corporal was roughed up and screamed at uh, uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, on one occasion, our convoy, our field artillery uh, unit, uh, was mobilized, and, and we always moved by... Uh, truck convoy. And on uh, this one occasion, we were on a fairly long trip to our next location. And we were in a residential area of a bombed out town in Germany uh, when all traffic stopped. Uh, we had no information as to the cause of the delay, but for well over an hour, we sat still without moving even an inch. And it was, I was in the vehicle directly behind the executive officer and the jeep driver. And uh, uh, I was able to observe uh, his mounting frustration with our uh, uh, traffic delay. Uh, the amount of verbal abuse that he had directed toward his driver just increased as the uh, hour went on. And finally, the lieutenant turned to the jeep driver and said, get out of the jeep. We're going to settle this like men. And he directed him to one of the houses, which was just an empty shell, and he pushed the corporal through an empty spot where the front door had been, and one stood, and as he went inside, he reached to his side and pulled out uh, his uh, hand weapon out of his holster. Uh, they went inside the building, uh, the next thing we heard were two shots. And before anybody could do anything or get there, out came the lieutenant in the corporal. Uh, it turned out that uh, he'd taken the corporal, backed him up against the wall, put the muzzle of his gun at his temple, but then as he pulled the trigger, just pulled up the, the gun so that the bullets went into the wall uh, rather than into the corporal's uh, brain. Now, uh, many of us saw this happen. It was. Uh, yard. Uh, it was a house that was very close to the street, uh, including the commanding officer of our unit. But uh, in a short while, the traffic jam was over. We got back in our uh, vehicles and uh, moved on to the place where we were going to be for the evening. Um, just as we were unloading at our new location, two military policemen arrived and they took the lieutenant into custody, and off he went. And about a half hour later, uh, we were uh, sitting under a tree with our mess kits full of supper, and of course, all the conversation was about the executive officer. And one of the interesting things is that those who hated him the most, and I do mean hate, uh, seemed to be the most forgiving. They. Uh, 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 talked at some length about the incident of the day, but uh, surprisingly, uh, they they were not uh, as critical 
uh, as you might expect under the circumstances. And I think that it can be uh, concluded that one of the things that they realized is that this lieutenant was out of their life forever. He was on his way to a military prison or to, to a mental ward. And they'd never see him again, never heard of him again. So if nothing else, I think this tells us something about the uh, power of forgetting and forgiving. Got to stop again. Next I'm going to tell you about some uh, exposure to some British uh, prisoners of war. Uh, in mid-April, uh, we advanced our position almost every day, and on some days for a distance of several miles. Uh, the German army had not collapsed, but there was a little resistance, and there was an absence of the usual sights and sounds of combat. In the late afternoon of this particular day, our first sergeant took me and one other enlisted man as an advance party to an area that we were to occupy later in the day. We were posted at the main intersection uh, on the town of Isleben, Germany. Isleben, incidentally, is the birthplace of Martin Luther. Uh, our assignment was to give directions to the 385th convoy as they approached the intersection. We were standing at the intersection when at about 5 p.m. we were approached by two males who spoke with distinct British accents. They explained that they had been long-time prisoners of war, having been captured in Africa. Uh, they had been freed earlier that day when American forces came to uh, that town. They mentioned that several uh, that they had been in uh, several prison of war camps, uh, but some months earlier, uh, a small number of British prisoners uh, had been brought to Islaven to work in a sugar beet uh, factory. Uh, the days were long, uh, the work was hard, but they had not been mistreated. Uh, they commented that while the Germans may have felt they were getting a considerable amount of free labor. Uh, the POWs did get a measure of revenge. They explained that uh, since their arrival, at least one of them had introduced a sample of human elimination into the sugar mixing vat. This is just an approximation of how they actually described it. Uh, as we parted company, we, de we declined their offer for free sugar. Uh, the next uh, topic are uh, the uh, German death camps. Nordhausen is uh, not a name familiar to many people. It was a death camp, but because it was smaller, it did not get the publicity of the better known places such as Auschwitz. Now if you visit the Holocaust Museum in Washington, uh, you will note that the 3rd Armored Division is credited <laughs> with liberating Nordhausen. However, uh, one unit of our 104th Infantry Division uh, did assist them in that uh, uh, liberation. Now, once it was freed, a number of our people uh, got inside the camp, including some close friends of mine. And not only did they uh, view the inside, but they were able to take pictures, and I still have some of those pictures uh, uh, in my possession. But uh, even with the pictures, it's hard to describe the things that, uh, that they saw. I'm going to uh, read a paragraph uh, from the uh, official history book of 104th Division. And alongside that uh, uh, paragraph is a picture that was taken at the Nordhausen uh, death camp. But the account from our history uh, reads as follows. In Nordhausen, the division found a large concentration of German concentration of political prisoners, discovering 5,000 corpses, and among the 6,000 inmates in various stages of decay. The corpses were scattered throughout the buildings and grounds of the large camp, and all of them appeared to have been starved to such an extent that they were mere skeletons wrapped in skin. 
Most of the bodies apparently lay untouched since death had overtaken them. But some were stacked like cordwood on the stairways. In almost all bunkers and buildings, the living were found lying among the dead. In one corner was a pile of arms and legs. All medical personnel that could be spared in the division were rushed to the scene to give medical aid. The Burgermeister of Norrhausen, having fled, his assistant was contacted by the military government and given explicit instructions regarding laws and ordinances uh, that the responsibility placed on him. Neither he nor any other civilian would admit knowledge of the Nordhausen concentration camp. Hundreds of male citizens of the town were ordered to the camp and were under guard, where they worked several days carrying litter cases and collecting corpses by hand. They dug mass graves on a prominent hill near the camp and carried the corpses through the town to the graves. Now even today you can hear people uh, say that there was no such thing as the Holocaust. And it would seem that if we just uh, showed them one of these photographs, that should be sufficient to convince them that yes, there was a Holocaust. Now the uh, uh, other major event that I wanted to talk about was the meeting up uh, with the Russian army. Uh, from the third week of March, until the third week of April, the First Army advanced 375 miles eastward. Uh, this alone is evidence of the German army, that the German army was in a state of collapse. <coughs> Rumors were flying that uh, elements of the First Army uh, would be the first to meet up with the Russians. Uh, there was even speculation in our group that perhaps elements of our own 104th uh, Division uh, might make the first contact. Meanwhile, uh, to the south, uh, the Third Army uh, was moving eastward at a fast pace. And almost without warning, all elements of the German forces facing the Third Army uh, surrendered in just a total collapse. And it was only a matter of hours before <coughs> there was a contact uh, with the Russians. So that was the official link up of the U.S. Uh, forces with the Russians. Now we were advised in our group that the Russians uh, opposite us would move to the Mold River, M-U-L-D-E River, and would stop. And that's exactly how it happened. Uh, when our field artillery unit arrived at the Mold, we looked across and there were the Russian soldiers. Uh, the official link up, of course, had taken place uh, several days earlier, uh, south of us, and as a result, our contact with the Russians was anticlimactic. There were some waves across the river, but no mass celebration, uh, no vodka, uh, no champagne, uh, and at our location, there were no bridges and no boats and no way to get across the river. So, as a result, even though we did meet up with the Russians, uh, not one of us ever uh, had the opportunity of going over and shaking their hands. Uh, they were a, uh, a very worn out looking group of soldiers. Their uh, uniforms were, uh, you might say, almost tattered and they looked uh, more than exhausted and that's understandable considering the uh, things that uh, I've been through. But uh, at that point uh, we knew that the war was over because when we reached this location on the riverbank, we didn't even take the covers off of our houses. Uh, we just put them in place because it was obvious that there would be uh, no more action with the Germans. Did you make any close friendships while you were in the service? Well, you get, uh, you get to uh, uh, have more than close association with some of the fellow uh, soldiers in your unit. Uh, uh, for example, they issue you uh, half of a pup tent, so you've always got to find uh, somebody to join up with you <coughs> to pitch your pup tent for the night. So uh, uh, we were we were together 24 hours a day, and there was uh, the people in my unit that I was well acquainted with, and uh, we all got along. Uh, we were uh, from different parts of the country, different backgrounds, but. Uh, 
uh, certainly it was a, a, a friendly, uh, congenial group of people. Did you continue, did you continue any of those relationships? Well, because uh, these people were from all parts of the country, once they were discharged, uh, <coughs> they went their separate ways and uh, it really wasn't that easy to maintain contact and as a result, uh, I didn't have any ongoing uh, relationship with any of the people that I had served with. Did you join a veterans organization? Uh, no, I did not join. Um, after the end of the war in Germany, how soon and in what way did you return to the United States? After the end of the war in Germany, how soon and in what way did you return to the United States? Uh, as soon as the uh, war was uh, <clears throat> over, uh, we uh, uh, left our position uh, on the riverbank and moved to uh, the uh, city of Holly, H-A-L-L-E. And this was a city that was pretty much intact and that has not really been subjected to much uh, damage from the war. And uh, they put us up in sort of like a dormitory that was either a college or a training unit. And we stayed there for a couple of weeks. And uh, we then were trucked to a, a rail station and we were placed in boxcars uh, for the trip back to France. Now the boxcars were known as 40 and 8. Uh, 40 and 8 is a, a term that was well known to all of the veterans of World War I because that was the primary means of transportation then. And the 40 and 8 refers to the capacity of the boxcars. It can hold 40 men and 8 mules. And uh, uh, it was the uh, way that we were packed in on our, uh, and to make the rail trip uh, back to France. Uh, we were so packed into that uh, freight car that we all had to roll out our bedrooms at the same time each night and then we all had to get up at the same time the next morning because we were just, uh, you could not have put another body in there. But, uh, you know, the war was over and uh, so there was not a, a, a lot of uh, uh, concern that, that we had that inconvenience. I think it probably took at least three or four days for us to get back to La Havre, France. And we were there for a week or two and uh, then we boarded a ship that had been a, a luxury uh, passenger ship that had been converted to uh, 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 a, a troop ship and uh, headed back and uh, we arrived back in the States uh, in the uh, first week of July. Uh, the trip back, of course, uh, was much faster uh, than the one going over. And on the trip back, because the ship was so crowded, uh, we only had a bunk every other night. Every other night we had to sleep on our bedroll on the, on the deck. And we had two meals a day. But again, because the war was over, uh, there were no complaints. Was there a welcome home celebration when your unit returned? Our, uh, our uh, troop ship arrived uh, in New York uh, just at daybreak. And because the uh, piers weren't quite ready for us, they had to drop anchor for a while. And uh, there was a little bit of uh, fog uh, around that morning. But as the day wore on as the sun came out, the fog lifted and we could, uh, we could see a, some kind of an object in front of us. And uh, in a short while, it was obvious that the object in front of us was the Statue of Liberty. So there we were, uh, returning home and right in front of us uh, on a July morning in full sunlight was the Statue of Liberty. And it was almost the kind of experience that you expect in a movie as, as opposed to uh, a real life uh, kind of experience and the sort of thing that uh, certainly I'm sure everyone will remember. And as we pulled on into the uh, docking area, there was a small craft uh, circling around us that had uh, a band and people dancing and uh, uh, waving and shouting and, and things of that sort. And uh, the uh, ship then docked 
And as we walked down the uh, gangplank, uh, there was a young woman from the United Service Organization uh, standing there handing each of us something. Now that something that she handed us uh, was an item that none of us had experienced in the whole time that we had been uh, out of the country. What it was, was a container of whole milk. So that was our reward upon uh, returning to the country. Where were you when the war ended in Japan? Uh, after we uh, landed in, uh, in New York in July, all of us were given uh, a 30-day leave of furlough, and we reassembled uh, at a, a military base in Indiana. And we boarded the train then for the West Coast because our division was slated for uh, duty in Japan. So, uh, we were, in fact, we were one of the first full divisions to return to this country. And uh, in, in route to the West Coast, we were uh, out perhaps in Arizona, New Mexico, somewhere of that, in that part of the country, when the first atom bomb was dropped. And then uh, uh, we got to our destination. We were sent to Camp San Luis Obispo, California. And just about the time we arrived, the second bomb was dropped. And then within a matter of days, the, the Japan War was over. And uh, our whole camp emptied out and went to the streets of San Luis Obispo, the town, uh, to celebrate. It was a, a joyous occasion. When were you discharged, and how soon did you resume an active civilian life? Uh, I was discharged in December of uh, '45, and uh, I was uh, halfway, uh, slightly better than halfway through college at that point. So the uh, spring semester at the University of Illinois began in January, and so <clears throat> in a matter of a few weeks, I was back at the University of Illinois. And one of the things that uh, was very helpful is that I uh, was able to take advantage of the GI Bill uh, to pay for my uh, college expenses. So I had a very brief period of time between being discharged and returning to civilian life. What was your first employment following the military service? Uh, after I graduated from college, I went to work for a uh, paper packaging firm in Wisconsin. And uh, uh, a bit later, that firm was acquired by an American Can Company. And uh, after the acquisition, uh, all of our offices were moved to the uh, New York City location. So I uh, transferred there, and uh, I spent all of my working days at American Can and did uh, retire from American Can. I was in the Corporate Human Resources Department there at the time of my retirement. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, war is uh, not easy. And uh, no one uh, would enter into that kind of thing uh, willingly or without uh, uh, a just cause. But uh, uh, perhaps the, the best justification that I can uh, uh, offer is to look at the death camp at Nordhausen, uh, which our unit uh, uh, was a part of liberating. And when you look at the things that went on there, uh, you have to say to yourself, this is the kind of thing that had to be uh, stopped. And uh, had it not been stopped, uh, maybe civilization as we know it would not have been able to continue in the same manner. So, uh, for that reason, I think it was right and just and correct that uh, we ended the war and we did, did the things that we did. Did you attend any reunions? No, I did not belong to any organizations or attend any reunions. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, uh, <clears throat> most of us who went in had not really traveled extensively. <laughs> we had not met people from other parts of the country. And uh, it was a broadening experience to 
be exposed to people from other areas, uh, from other nationalities, uh, to be acquainted with other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Uh, it was uh, uh, certainly one of the pluses uh, that uh, can be identified as a part of uh, being a part of uh, a military operation. I think also, if you're an enlisted man, that means you're, uh, or you're a corporal as I was, uh, you're at the low end of the hierarchy, and uh, so a lot of people order you around, tell you to do things, and sometimes even take advantage of you. And uh, having had those experiences, I think you've come out of it more tolerant and more understanding of what uh, perhaps some other people uh, encounter. Uh, one other thing that uh, uh, I learned in uh, the part of the military that the time that I was in Germany, uh, or in Europe, was uh, something about personal hygiene. Because from the period of uh, September 44 until, uh, Mar uh, until April of 45, I only had one shower. So you learn how to care for yourself if you're in a, in a circumstance like that. And uh, that's just a little bit of an aside of uh, one of the things that you encounter when you come back. And having only one shower sounds kind of bad, but <clears throat> then you stop to realize that there are other people not too far away who are in fierce combat, uh, being wounded, killed, captured, or other things which are uh, far worse than one of them. But, uh, finding a place to take a shower. Is there anything else you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Well, a, a good many people are familiar with the book uh, that was written by Tom Brokaw uh, called The Greatest Generation. He referred to the uh, people of World War II as the greatest generation. And um, it, it's uh, quite an honor to be thought of in that respect. and. Uh, uh, in some ways, I think that perhaps it, it's a, an appropriate designation because uh, there were some uh, amazing feats of uh, bravery in service that uh, uh, took place uh, uh, during the war. It's unfortunate that those of us from World War II had and continue to have that kind of recognition and that kind of honor, and yet the people who served in Korea in Vietnam uh, did not. In fact, uh, in, in some instances, the, the people from Vietnam were uh, e even uh, uh, looked look down upon. And uh, it's very hard to understand how that could have happened because those people suffered the same inconveniences and the same casualties as any of the rest of us. But um, it uh, is one of those things that is, is difficult to explain. It's unfortunate that uh, those attitudes uh, existed. Uh, one of the other uh, observations that I would make about World War II is it's disturbing to me to realize that uh, uh, our country chose to uh, destroy two cities uh, with the atom bomb. Uh, I wish that there could have been a way that the atom bomb could have been exploded in some remote area of Japan to demonstrate uh, to the Japanese the power of the bomb. Uh, but instead, they, they uh, chose to destroy uh, two major cities. And there's no question but what it, it shortened the war, saved many lives. It may have even saved my own life. But uh, it, it's uh, a feeling that uh, if somehow that bomb could have been uh, exploded in a way that uh, would have avoided uh, that great loss of life, uh, I think that would have been a far better way to do it. And, uh, and we, now our country is in a posture of telling uh, others that uh, uh, they can't use the atom bomb or they can't even own it. And our position uh, is weakened by the fact that we did at one time do that. And even though we all felt justified in its use, uh, it's unfortunate that it was used in the way that it was. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Roberts, for letting me interview you.